Hey, this is a video about chapter two in our book, Critical Thinking by Lewis Vaughn. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about obstructions or obstacles to critical thinking. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about another aspect of the information I hope that you're kind of getting down. Remember that you should also have a look at the chapter notes. Uh, they're PowerPoints. So they just walk through the chapter just as it is. Um, but some of the things like crucial sentences, big words, keywords, that kind of stuff um, will show up there as well, easier for you to find and kind of cobble together than walking through the book every time you want to look at something. So anyway, it's there. Um, so obstacles to critical thinking happen in two ways. Um, they happen because of how we think about things, and they happen because of what we think about things, uh, which sounds like pretty much everything, how we think and what we think. But they're focused on a couple of main concepts. Um, the first one is psychological. Okay, Psychological obstacles to critical thinking are obstacles put in our way because of how we think about things. Okay, um, The first issue we have is with our own selves. Okay, Nobody likes to be called a liar. Nobody likes to be in the wrong about something, um, misunderstood, misunderstanding. Um, there's all kinds of things that um, we get kind of rumpled about, and it gets in the way of us thinking clearly and critically about a host of issues, okay? So the big thing about yourself getting in the way is thinking about critical thinking, cr thinking less critically than we should about very important issues. I'm going to stand over here so I, you can actually see me, which I don't think that's a big deal. Um, Psychological obstacles, um, you can get around them. You can watch out for them. Um, you know what your hot button topics are. Um, you know if somebody starts talking about abortion, um, you have an opinion, okay? Um, perhaps your opinion is just a knee jerk, um, which is basically a reflex. You um, are adamantly against um, abortion being legalized, being legal, um, any of that kind of stuff. And you know that when somebody starts talking about pro-choice or anything like that, that you're just, you're just going to get all upset and not be able to think clearly um, or listen to their argument. And it's good to know those things about yourself, okay? One thing is, in a psychological obstacle, you need to learn how to detect your self-interested thinking. Now, being self-interested is not always bad. Okay, we have to watch out for ourselves. We have to guard our hearts in a lot of ways. Um, but in this thing, you have to think about what happens when you get um, emotional about something. Um, perhaps, um, and I'll give you a personal one for me. Um, I, I have, um, in my history, in my past, um, I was a victim of domestic violence. And so I don't do jokes about stuff like that. Um, people around me find out very quickly um, that you don't joke about beating up your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever. Um, it's not funny in the first place. And second of all, yeah, I just can't, can't go there. Um, so be aware of what your hot button topics are. Be aware when you're getting emotional, okay? Um, and um, be careful when the ideas are being undermined by manipulation, okay? Think about um, car advertisements, okay? Everybody has the best selection. Everybody has the best cars. This is the best value. This one has the best gas. Well, they can't all be the best, right? Um, but part of what ads do is kind of crank up that manipulation. Um, and not just car ads, um, pretty much anybody who's trying to sell you something, okay, they can get a little bit out of balance. Um, the last piece is to make sure you've looked at all the evidence, not just the stuff that agrees with you, but the stuff that doesn't agree with you. Um, case in point, um, there's a, a lot of folks believe that vaccinations cause autism. Um, there was a rigged study done years and years ago that linked the two ideas, linked the two, the two pieces together. 
Um, since then, that particular study, quote unquote, has been debunked, which means it isn't true. Um, lots and lots of studies have been done to find out if it's possible, if it's true. Um, and they all say no. Now, um, there are a lot of folks who still do not believe that they should immunize their children. Um, and it is a choice, okay? We don't have mandatory immunizations in, in the United States. But you have to think about which is the worst idea. Even if you're convinced that the, the vaccinations are going to cause some terrible thing with your child, um, you have to weigh the options, right? Um, people die from the measles. People die from smallpox. People die from polio. All of these things that here in the States we thought were eradicated um, are now coming back because we have this whole group of people who have not decided to vaccinate their kiddos. Well, there's a personal part of that for me. Um, I have lupus and that means my immune system is too busy beating up on various parts of my body to pay attention to such mild things like the measles or something like that. Um, I'm also old enough that I got, when I was a kid, I got immunizations that were um, dead virus. Um, we now know that that doesn't give you lifelong immunity. Uh, we thought it did, but it doesn't. Um, and so if I got the immunization, got a booster shot, whatever, I would get the measles. Um, I've had typhoid that way. Um, don't do that again. And so I'm kind of one of those folks with a compromised immune system who is relying on the rest of the herd um, to keep me healthy. Um, doesn't work very well in today's climate, but that's, it is what it is. So we have to think about ways that or things that might disagree with us and how credible they are. That's part of critical thinking. Okay. And you've learned this in your um, writing classes too, right? Um, you have to look at opposing arguments. You have to look at evidence that doesn't quite agree with you and see whether or not you should entertain it. Um, see whether or not it's you know, clear enough, it's true enough, it's got enough backing to support it. Okay, so this thing says um, we should build more parking, okay, because it's really hard to find a parking place on campus. And we like that idea, okay, because we'd like to be able to find a parking place for our 10 o'clock class and not have to get here at 8 o'clock. Well, then there's all these other pieces. There's um, an impact on the land. There's an impact on the animals around here. There's an impact on our little tiny road that's two lanes. And how do you figure out where to go on that one? Excuse me. Um, but there's a lot of other things out there that we have to think about. Cost. Um, we have to think about environmental impact, how long it's going to take, what kinds of problems it's going to cause while we're doing it. Um, there's all kinds of information that we have to think about. We can't just say, oh, yes, all the students want us to build parking, a, a new parking deck, so we're going to do that. Um, it's not quite that easy. Most things aren't quite that easy. Okay? So in our psychological problems, self-interest alone, just because we like something, doesn't mean that it can establish the truth of a claim. Okay? Um, on the bottom of page 35, there are three things there. He lays out, watch out when things get very personal, be alert to ways that critical thinking can be undermined, and ensure that nothing has been left out. And then he explains how we do this. Okay. Think about, okay, you support Hillary Clinton, okay, or you support Donald Trump for the United States elections for president. And somebody posts something on Facebook or Instagram or whatever that calls into question the other candidates um, morals or ideals or whatever okay and you think it's hysterical okay you think it's wonderful great look they finally caught this person a lie whatever and so you post it come to find out it's not true then what do you do okay um, somebody shows you on snopes.com or whatever that this is totally fabricated, this person has never said this, never done this, and why would you post it? Why would you 
to use the archaic kind of term, bear false witness against somebody um, on purpose. Okay, and you're like, wait, 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 wait. I was just passing things along. I didn't actually write the article. I didn't, but you didn't check either. Probably didn't even read the article. Oh, this is juicy. I'm going to pass that on. Think about what you do to backpedal, okay? To try to make your action seem less heinous than it was. Okay, we call that saving face. Um, and some cultures are much more ingrained with this than others. Um, some areas of our country are much more ingrained with this. Um, I have a friend in Oklahoma who wrote a book called Honor Bound, and he did a lot of research. He's a social psychologist. Um, a lot of research on why people do things based on a code of honor. Um, and most of the time, we're not talking about knights and chivalry here, um, although that is one of the types. Um, we're talking about folks who are absolutely mortified when they find out they're wrong about something. Okay, And so they try to play it down, or they get angry and lash out because somebody's calling them a liar. Okay, All of those things come under the self problem with obstacles to critical thinking, and we call that saving face. Okay, we try to say, well, no, that didn't happen, or who are you to call me into the question? We've all seen people like that. We've probably done those things before, uh, but saving face is one of the ways that we undermine our own critical thinking. Okay, so be aware of where those things happen. Um, the other part, the other side of this is on psychological is the power of the group, okay? And by group, we mean anybody who's around you, okay, your classmates, your family, your friends, um, especially people who are like you, okay? Whether that's um, they're in the same position as you, okay, classmates as opposed to your instructor, um, colleagues at work as opposed to your supervisor, um, those are your peer group. Okay, they're the same as you based on position or gender or, you know, wherever you are. So that peer group has a lot of influence on you. And remember back to eighth grade, okay? I think eighth grade is probably the most traumatic year um, of middle school. And most people look back at your eighth grade self and you're like, glad I'm not that person anymore. Um, Eighth graders are just weird. I taught them for a long, long, long time, um, and I love eighth graders, but they are a little weird. Think about how important it was that the folks sitting around you thought you belonged there, whether that was to be cool or to be a jock or to to fit in. Um, your peer group has a lot of influence on you, and a lot of times we will kind of fudge our way into what we believe or what we think about a certain person or band or movie or TV show, whatever, so that other people will accept us, so that we'll like them. Um, and most of the time it's pretty harmless, um, but sometimes not so much. Um, you think about um, the folks at a Trump rally, okay? They have a certain look, they have a certain ideal, um, they have a certain focus. And if you wanna be part of that, then you have to be that same kind of person. Um, and, and so it's difficult if you're not quite all the way in a particular camp, whether it's political or religious or whatever, um, sometimes it can be a little interesting um, to find yourself kind of on the outside edges of something. And so we try to fit in better. Um, sometimes, not so much, okay? Um, the older you get, I think the less this is a problem um, because you've seen, okay, things kind of ebb and flow, it's not permanent. Um, but part of the idea here as far as um, fitting in with a group, um, critical thinking can get undermined. You may know that there are certain things that are not true about what this group believes. Um, but you like the folks in the group and so you go along. Everybody assumes that you believe the same way they do. Um, and when that comes out that you don't, people can get really bent out of shape. So think about, okay, what happens to us when we're part of a group and when we're not, okay? Um, the other part about group 
kind of obstacles is a sense of tradition. That's the way we've always done things. Okay. Now, tradition can be good. Thanksgiving traditions, you know, we go to grandma's house and we have this huge turkey and potatoes and all this stuff. And everybody's in a food coma later because of the tryptophan and yeah. Um, this is what we do. This is our tradition. That kind of tradition is good, right? Because it builds community, it builds family, ties you back together, shared memories and all of that. Some traditions um, are harmful, okay? Um, remember when I was talking in chapter one a little bit, and it's more so here in chapter two, um, about prejudice and bias and that kind of thing. Most of the time, the reason we develop prejudices and stereotypes is because the folks around us have had those. And it's family oriented, it's politically oriented, it's regional. Um, you can tell from my accent that I am not from North Carolina, okay? Um, I grew up in Ohio. I've lived, you know, a decade or more in Anchorage, Alaska, 15 years in Oklahoma City, and now I'm in North Carolina. Um, I have an accent, but it's not the same one that my husband has or that the people around here have. And it's, it identifies me right away. I open my mouth in the grocery store, at the bank, whatever, everybody knows, oh, she's not from around here. And so there are certain things that I can't take for granted here. Um, there are certain ways that I take for granted, my prejudice um, in some ways, is that there are, there's no reason to call people names, okay? Um, there's no reason to use words against somebody or to represent somebody that they would not find useful or helpful or good. Um, and it's not being PC, um, it's being considerate and it's being a decent human being. Um, there are lots of words that never say, especially when they're directed towards another person. Um, and there are things that I have heard in the last two years since I've lived here in North Carolina that just appall me. Um, and it's from people I like. And we tend to want people that we like to be like us, right? Have the same ideas, have the same ideals. Um, and when we find out they don't, whoa, okay, we have to kind of readjust ourselves. Um, and we have to decide, do we say something or do we shut up? Um, and yeah, I'm not one to shut up. I like to talk, yes, but there are certain things that I think if you're silent, you're complicit. And certain prejudiced, bigoted ideas are definitely in that category for me. Um, speaking of that, if you look on page 40, this is one of the things up here, um, the box on page 40 is talking about prejudice, bias, stereotypes, and racism, and how one leads to the other, and how to break the chain. Um, it's very important, it's this little, I mean, it's like two or three paragraphs, um, but part of what makes our current civil culture um, so difficult is because we have not confronted people on racism. Um, I mean, look at me, I'm a white girl. Okay, I, we don't have any power over how we show up basically. Um, you know, red hair, blue eyes, sunburnt at the drop of a hat. Um, and I grew up in a very conservative area in Northeast Ohio, okay? Um, when I first went to elementary school and first went to kindergarten, um, I was a minority in my, in my school. Um, most of my fellow students were African-American. Um, and we're talking, this is like 1968, so big time uh, segregation and stuff, but not in our town. Um, we were more segregated by um, socioeconomic issues than we were by color. Um, my parents and I, we lived in government housing and, um, most of my friends were African American. I had no idea that was a big deal. Um, when you're little, you don't, you don't realize, um, that the adults have problems with things. Um, so there are lots of ways that we have been brought up differently. You have different from me, different from the next person. And we have to think critically about the things we hold near and dear to our hearts, um, should they be there? 
um, should we automatically distance ourselves from somebody because they're different from us, whatever we call different? Um, I would say no. It's a, an individual person, right? It's a, in my mind, it's all human beings are the image bearer of God. And how, how, do you, how do you hold somebody at a lower standard than other folks um, just because they don't look like you? Okay. Um, you know, I have lots of philosophical and theological issues on that one, so I'll save that for some other time. Um, but think about what we can do on an individual, on a group basis, um, to lessen the seriousness of the racism in our country. Um, especially if you're a white person, um, you automatically have an easier time of it, especially if you're a white man. Um, and that may not be true individually, again, this is stereotyping in a little way, um, but traditionally, white men in the United States have had power. Um, the fact that now we share, at least in part, um, is a big deal. And we need to make sure it becomes less and less of a deal as we go along. Um, think about, look at that box on page 40. Um, the other piece in this is philosophical obstacles. Um, and we get our fourth big word, worldview, on page 43. Um, a worldview is a philosophy of life a set of fundamental ideas that helps us make sense of a wide range of important issues in life. That's a lot, right? A worldview is not so much how you view the world, but how your particular philosophy, personal philosophy, um, helps you react to and find a place in the world, okay? We're gonna talk about worldview all throughout the course, and the last paper you're gonna write, the third paper you're gonna write is your own personal world. How'd you get it? Where'd it come from? Um, how do you know when something is right or wrong? That's a big part of your worldview. Okay, what do you do if there's something wrong? Okay. Um, philosophical obstacles are in what we think about things. Okay. And down here on the board, you can see we have two kinds of relativism. Okay. Now, if you read this section carefully, please read this section carefully, you will find that Dr. Vaughn, like most philosophers, say that relativism is not tenable. Okay, relativism doesn't work. Um, there are certain things that are universals, okay, are absolutes. Um, I would say the first one that comes to most people's minds is you don't kill other folks. Okay, um, don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat. Don't, those are things that are true all across the world. Okay, now what we mean by cheat, what we mean by steal might differ a little bit, but we shouldn't do it, right? Um, subjective real relativism says that whatever I think is true is true for me and you can't say anything about it. Okay, that's wrong. Doesn't work. Partly because if it were true, it would mean that I'm infallible, you're infallible. It means we can't make mistakes. We all know that's not true. Um, we make mistakes all the time. Mispronunciations, um, all kinds of interesting things. Um, subjective relativism doesn't work because it, it, it would have to be that we were each and every one of us infallible, cannot make mistakes, and that's not true, so it doesn't work. The other thing about it doesn't work is if I say everything I say is absolutely true, okay? No, that doesn't work either, okay? Um, and you can't judge me for it. Well, that's not how the world works either, is it? Um, every time somebody opens their mouth, you have somebody in the room that goes, yeah, who gives you the right to talk, okay? Um, there's a lot of that out there. And so thinking that relativism works or is right um, doesn't get you very far not philosophically, not truthfully, not anything. Um, the other part of this is social relativism, um, which says basically that what your culture defines as right and wrong 
is right and wrong, period. And you can't judge another culture for what they deem as right or wrong. Sounds pretty good. Cultures are big entities, right? We have Western culture, I'm talking Europe, the Americas, um, you know, all that Western kind of us culture. Okay, lots of, lots of stuff going on there, lots of stuff behind it. Um, still not right, okay? Um, if you doubt this, think about this, Nazi Germany. In their culture, it was right and good and rewarded to kill those who were not of the Aryan ideal. We find that absolutely abhorrent, absolutely heinous. Something like 11 million people died. Six million of those were Jewish. Um, think about Stalin, um, the Soviet system um, responsible for close to 12 million deaths. That's wrong. That's not something that we can say is right for their culture. Okay. Um, the mutilation of children in some other cultures, not right. Okay. Just because their culture says we do this doesn't make it right. Um, if cultural relativism were true, I would be standing here in front of you. Most of you would not be in college. Okay? The culture, Western culture, um, until very, very recently, the grand scheme of things, um, believed that only male landowners should be educated. Okay? Um, so unless your grandfather owned more than 50 acres, you wouldn't be in college. In fact, you wouldn't be in high school. Um, and, of course, you had to be male. Now, there were exceptions to that, but there always are. Um, nowadays, almost anybody can come to college. I'm a teacher. I have a master's degree. I have two master's degrees. Um, that, you know, I'm the first one in my family to finish a bachelor's degree. Um, and let alone master's and PhD work and all that. It hasn't been that long that that was really, really weird. Um, cultures don't stay still, um, cultures evolve, cultures um, most often through revolution and through somebody standing up and saying, no, not enough, not, not ever again, Rosa Parks, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, we have to have broader and bigger ideas than it's right for me, I guess, who are we individually? Um, we need our communities, we need our cultures, um, we need our families, um, and I don't just mean blood family. Um, sometimes those who are related to you by blood are toxic and you have to go find your own new family, and that's okay. Um, the other part of the roadblocks is skepticism, um, and there are varying degrees of this as well. Um, if you go extreme skepticism, you don't think we can really know anything and um, unless something is absolutely true, then it's false, okay? Now, this is again where we get into the idea of objective truth. Um, personally, I think it's really difficult to be objective about a lot of things. Um, we're humans, we have emotions, um, we're not just brains on sticks. Um, we have emotions, we have bodies, We you know, perceive the world individually, but we have to act and we need the support of other humans in order to thrive and survive, okay? If you doubt that, think about all the stuff in your house. Could you recreate it all? How about an ibuprofen? How about a Tylenol? Okay, my feet hurt today, so I'm thinking about painkillers. Um, what about even something as simple as doorknobs on your on your house doorknobs locks okay now i can put stuff on the door and slide a big stick or a two by four or something in there but i have to get that stuff from somewhere else um, imagine just in our classroom just in my classroom where i am now there are 20 computers at least I'm using my husband's lab for 
videotaping. Um, chairs, comfortable chairs, okay? Something you could sit in for a half an hour without scrunching around. Um, hand sanitizer, um, glass for the windows. Um, yeah, you get the point. We are not self-sufficient. And I don't think we're supposed to be. Um, but skepticism says if we can't know it absolutely, we can't know it at all. Um, which again is pushing things a bit, right? Um, in critical thinking, we're looking at truth being as objective as we possibly can be. Can you say for sure that if I sit down on that chair, it's going to hold me? Yeah, yeah. 99 and a half percent accuracy, right? I'm going to make sure it's not wobbly. Um, I'm going to make sure that it's not a little tiny kid's chair that I'm going to sit on. Um, okay. You have a lot of faith in chairs. Um, am I going to know that when I turn my computer on, it's actually going to do what I want it to do? Mostly. Um, my computer's a little, my laptop's a little bit old, but it does the job. It gets things done. Skepticism, though, says because I can't know for sure, absolutely for sure, I can't know anything. Um, and it doesn't count. If you look on um, page 46, um, we know these ideas not because they are beyond all possible doubt, but because they are beyond all reasonable doubt. Think about trials, okay? Courtroom trials. Um, you have to prove somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? If a reasonable, rational person looked at the evidence, they could say, oh yeah, this person is most likely guilty. And we messed that up, right? Um, <laughs> imagine, I mean, think about the number of folks who have been released from prison due to DNA evidence that says you got the wrong person. Um, so we know more and more all the time, sort of. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff with that too. Um, go back through chapter two read through the PowerPoints, make sure you get the crucial sentences. Um, there are at least three. Um, we have one big word. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten keywords um, at the end on page 46. And you have some homework to do. Um, exercises in chapter two all together. Please don't forget about your summary outline thing. Um, however, you can put together chapter two um, in a page or so. Um, you can do more than that, but it has to be at least a page. Okay. Um, again, as always, if you have questions, let me know. I'll be happy to help. Okay. Have a good day. And meet up front close.